Um, before we begin, I'm just going to date this for the recording. It is March 6th, 2019. We are on the Divina cruise ship out at sea at the Holistic Holiday at Sea. Thank you all for coming. This is a recovery panel. My name is Jessica Porter. I'm here to moderate today. We have a bunch of amazing stories that you're going to hear. Um, what we're going to do is time each person for five minutes. And as we go down the table, that'll take some time. And then we'll have questions and answers with the remaining time that we have that you guys can take. I want you to know that tomorrow at what time? 2.15 in the disco, in the Galaxy Disco, there will be a recovery panel discussion group. So if there's any questions you don't get to ask today, or you think of something between now and then, please come there tomorrow at 2.15 in the disco. Um, without further ado, because we've waited so long to begin, let's get started. Sheldon, do you have a mic down there? Nope. Can someone pull, pull a mic out of the box for Sheldon? And the timer, just so everyone knows, is will you raise your hand? Thank you very much. Our timer is there, so please keep your eyes on her. She's going to give you a 500 to 1. Everybody, please help me to welcome Sheldon Rice. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. So it was about 34 years ago that I had the good, I had the good fortune of being invited to a macrobiotic dinner, and it was, I was really impressed. The food was good. The people had great energy. I, I got up the next morning, I'm macrobiotic, yay. Nothing was bothering me, or at least I didn't realize anything was bothering me. And I began. And I, I did very well, and I kept feeling better. And I kept, and the, and the more, and the, as time went on, I kept feeling better and better and better. The only thing is I had a problem with my bladder. And this problem persisted, but I kept saying, but I feel better. So I don't have to really do anything about it. So I never went to a doctor. Now, I, meanwhile, about a year and a half passed. I lost 70 pounds of my weight. So you would think it's time to see a doctor. Maybe yes. something's wrong, but no, I just kept going. Until I saw two of my toes turn black. That's when I thought, well, maybe I better see a doctor. So I went to a doctor, and of course he couldn't get me into a hospital bed fast enough. And then they took a CAT scan and found that I had a growth between my bladder and spine. So they arranged a, 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 a biopsy. And the morning of the biopsy, the radiologist came to explain to me what this procedure was going to be. And, uh, well, I heard this procedure, and it, it, it didn't sound very good, and I, and I started to ask questions. And the radiologist, she got so angry with me because I was asking too many questions. So I said, well, if she's getting angry with me, the hell with the goddamn uh, biopsy. <laughs> and I called up my wife, and I said, take me home. I don't need this biopsy. And why? Because I mean, in the meantime, I had been macrobiotic for so long, I had met and, and read about so many people who had cured themselves of, of cancer with a, um, with, with a macrobiotic diet, so why can't I? So that's what I did. And, and of course, I, I, had, I, I, I had the best advice. I, I, I would go every, uh, periodically, there was a um, uh, macrobiotic center in New York at the time. I was living in the States from 1980 to 90, and this was just that time period. And, and I kept getting better and better. But, and in the meantime, um, I started to take, at the beginning, I started to take tests to at least see, you know, what, to, to try to monitor, you know, just what was happening to me. Well, every time I would take a test, there was something else wrong. So I asked the doctor one day, tell me, what's, you know, how come, how come, you know, I, I, I have this diet that I'm on, maybe it has an effect on the test. 
So he didn't really know. So he, he didn't know what to tell me. So I said, you know what? Never mind these tests. And I stopped taking tests. That was 30 years ago. I still haven't taken a test since then. But anyway, anyway, it, um, in, it took me a while. And in June of 1990, uh, just before I returned to Israel, I, I said, well, I'll take one more CAT scan. And inside, I felt I knew I was OK. And, and there was no trace. There was no trace of the cancer. So it, it, was it food? Yes, food is really, really important. But I did a whole bunch of other things, which only in retrospect did I understand that were probably more important than the food. I, I changed my way of thinking. And, and not only did I change my way of thinking, but I needed to change my lifestyle. And you know what rhymes with life? is wife. So I needed to change my life, so I needed to change my wife. So I had to change my wife. <laughs> well, it turns out, <laughs> so it, it turns out I was doing other things. I, I was always focused. While I was in this healing mode, I was always focused on, well, I have to get up in the morning, and I have to cook, and I have to eat, and I have to go to work, and I never missed a day of work, and I never thought about my cancer, because uh, it didn't really matter to me what was going to be. What was mattered to me was now. How do I feel now? How do I feel today? And, and, and this is a very important point, is it, staying in the now, because when you're thinking about uh, you know, maybe I'll heal, maybe I won't heal. Then you start getting nervous and you start creating stress for yourself. So I was very fortunate that I was so stupid to do to think that way. <laughs> but it really, it really helped me. Sheldon, I'm going to have to cut you off just because we only have so much time for each person. Great. So thank you very much. to pay attention to the timer in the front row. Thank you, Sheldon. And next we have, uh, hold on, I'm Janet Graycraft. Janet Graycraft. <laughs> Janet Graycraft. That's right, you know your name. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, so Please help me to welcome Janet Raycraft. Raycraft. Hi, I'm Janet Raycraft, and my, um, my sto I'm gonna start my story uh, when I first but became aware of heart disease, and that was I was a junior in high school, and my I came was called to the office at school to find out that my father had a major heart attack at age 47. Uh, it changed our life somewhat at home, but I didn't really think that had anything to do with my medical future until much later. Um, I you know dietary wise, I'm sure you know my just by my age knowing. Uh, the history of food at that point, we were eating pretty much a standard American diet with a lot of um, English food because of my father's heritage uh, with you know lots of fats and things. But at age 49, I experienced chest pain and um, when it ended up not being cardiac, but they sent me, I'm sorry, the pain wasn't cardiac. They sent me for a nuclear stress test and the results of that were really alarming. Um, doctors told me that I had early onset coronary artery disease and that was when I really started waking up and realizing that I was following exactly and what had happened to my father. Um, I, um, I at that point uh, didn't really have much time to think before at 50 I had blockages and ended up having two stents uh, put in place. Uh, I went to cardiac rehab. Um, absorbed everything they told me to do, which was basically, you know, eliminate uh, the fat from the diet, go to fat-free dairy, you know, fat-free um, uh, products, um, you know, a very different approach from the American Heart Association, from, very different from what we're doing. Um, I went even to a dietitian. I was interested in finding out anything I could do to keep myself healthy. So uh, I continued to follow that American Heart Association diet that kind of cleaned it up over the next few years eating more of a Mediterranean type diet, giving up red meat, eating fish, chicken, uh, using olive oil, not using any butters, 
and I thought, well, I'm golden. I um, went to the doctors every, um, I went to the cardiologist every six months, you know, was taking an increasing number of cardiac medications, and um, over the, the and over the next few years, accumulated a lot of other disorders and more meds and more specialists. Um, so by the time I was 64, I, had, I was suffering from high blood pressure, high cholesterol, severe asthma, uh, often needing steroids in addition to my inhale, daily inhalers. Um, I had severe sleep apnea, stopped my, stop, my breathing stopped once every minute. Um, I didn't think that was possible. I was on a CPAP machine, which they kept increasing the pressure on, and they kept going to a more inclusive mask, which ended up with this full face mask um, by the time, you know, two years were up. Um, I had acid reflux. I had a uh, history through from my 20s on of migraines, which weren't really headaches, more auras, visual auras, where I sometimes would I'd see dots and then sometimes lose my vision temporarily. Um, I also had other symptoms that were more neurological that they thought was MS at the time. Uh, later ended up when the test became more sophisticated after 30 years, it indica indicated that I, know that I did not have MS, thankfully. Um, I, at age 64, um, I, was, I was going to the, I, I also during this period of time had started going to a gym on a regular daily basis, so I was going to the gym, uh, seven days a week, working out in a class and also working with a personal trainer for a short amount of time. And um, went on vacation and I didn't, what I didn't know, even though I had just gone to the cardiologist and had a clean, given, been given a clean bill of health because my numbers were so perfect from all the drugs I was taking, um, I ended up on vacation finding out that I had, I had an incident while fast walking with my son home from dinner, which normally wasn't something I would do, and I had um, I had a, an event that sent me to a doctor. He told he sent me immediately for an emergency cath, which then um, then resulted in an emergency bypass. Um, I uh, the, the the after effect was even much more severe because they said that you have. Um, I'm sorry. You have you had two to three days left to live prior to the to the bypass, and now you're just going to have more bypasses until your life is you know ended. Uh, they really didn't have much hope. I got that message on the west coast and the east coast, and um, I so it's been seven years now since I plan, changed plant based, and um, I have gotten rid of all the conditions that I just mentioned. And um, I just had a recent cath because they thought I was having a heart attack, and that indicated that I have no plaque in any artery. Five caths. Thank you very much. Next, we have Jess Miller. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take you back to December 15, 2008, uh, northern Michigan. There's a major blizzard going on. It turned out it was going to be the stormiest day of my life as well. Um, I woke up, uh, my wife telling me I needed to move a tree that had fallen across the road so she could get to work. I used uh, a buck saw to cut the tree, remove it, get it out of the way, came in to eat breakfast, and I started listening to some weird stuff going on in my body. All of a sudden, I had some painless things going on. I want to emphasize painless pressure in my chest, tingling down both arms, and I thought about the exertion of having just removed that tree, and then I thought to myself, hey, I'm only 56 years old, I'm pretty fit, I'm pretty trim, I've been on a Mediterranean diet for 20 years. Uh, I just had a physical, I was told I was a model patient, both my parents were alive and well in their 80s, it couldn't be happening to be, I couldn't be having a heart attack, but then my breathing became irregular, I started feeling clammy, I decided I better call 911. Uh, they were there in about seven minutes. My EKG was abnormal. I was told I was having a cardiac event. They hooked me up to oxygen. They put me on an IV nitro drip with a heavy chew on an aspirin. I'm on, you know, on the back of a gurney into an ambulance on the way to the hospital. 
got there, um, they couldn't find anything wrong. They were about ready to give up when they said, you know, we could do a cardiac cath. So I said, well, that'd be nice to know something. They did the cardiac cath and they found a near 100% blockage in the left anterior descending diagonal artery. If you've ever heard of that combination, it means Widowmaker. I was told, had I driven myself to the hospital, I probably would never have arrived. Um, so they did a consult with a surgeon. They said I needed immediate open heart bypass sternum splitting surgery. Um, I woke up two days later after being in intensive care. I was handed a cup full of pills. I said, what are these? They said, you're gonna be taking statins, blood thinners, beta blockers, and God knows what else for the rest of your life. You're a heart patient now and get used to it. That didn't sell well with me because I was not one that liked to take medications. I didn't have a history of taking medications. I thought there's gotta be a better thing here. I asked my doctors as they came to visit me, I said, what's going on here? They, I said, how could this have happened to me? They said, oh, it's idiopathic. I said, well, what's the prognosis? Yeah, you probably have to have stents every five to 10 years. You know, that's just the way it is. And I said, I get it, it didn't set well. So I was lucky enough that about a year and a half later, after having no explanation as to what's going on, I had a really progressive doctor introduce me to Caldwell Esselstein. He was speaking in our community. He said, you gotta listen to this guy. I listened to him, he changed my life completely. Um, I switched to a plant-based diet. <clears throat> um, and uh, the result of that was I started to feel better immediately. Um, I was able to uh, reduce um, my um, LD, uh, LDL uh, cholesterol for the first time in my life, uh, the first time it had been measured at the back of my 30s was 200. Um, on a Mediterranean diet, it was 125. I was able to get it down to 65. So uh, that was just phenomenal. I thought I was just one of those people that was predestined to have high LDL. As soon as I changed my diet, the LDL was sliced. Um, I lost 35 pounds. I never even knew how it happened. It just disappeared. I lost six inches in my waist. Um, I was able to get off all of my meds within a few months of switching to a plant-based diet. So um, I've been plant-based now for almost nine years. Um, my cardiologist says he cannot find any sign of heart disease in my body whatsoever. And he says he wishes he had other patients that were healthy. He says it's such, so refreshing to have a patient walk in my office once a year who doesn't have any symptoms of heart disease. So I just wanted to share that with you. And uh, I also want to say it has been an absolute thrill to be a part of this group. I just am amazed at what wonderful human beings I'm being able to associate with you. Thank you. Next, we have Judy McKenney. Uh, hello. <laughs> this is a very special panel for me. I've been on it many, many times. Um, and myself, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it started at stage two and went to stage four. I was told I had the end disease because Jackie Onassis had it at the time. And they told me that they would find a cure for her. Well, as you all know, she did not make it through. And there I was with this illness that uh, someone had made that statement about. Um, I began to do a lot of research to see how I could possibly, you know, heal from this cancer. And uh, I saw, I first started with pain in my kidney on New Year's Eve. That's how it all began. And I was 49 at the time. And um, we went, I went to see a local doctor, and the local doctor told me he, um, he really didn't know what was wrong, but after the tests, I needed to go into Dana-Farber in Boston. I went to Dana-Farber, and they examined me and said, yes, I had um, the first of the stage two non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but they knew that it would develop and become much more aggressive. And they told me that I needed to be on uh, chemotherapy. And I said, well, I want to go home and think about that. I'm not sure that's the way I wish to go. And they told me it was the only way. Um, I read a book um, by, um, Bernie Siegel, and it was Love, Medicine, and Miracles. 
and I decided that I wanted to find him. And he, lived, he was in Connecticut. I lived in Massachusetts. And I went there to um, just be around other women who had cancer and to see how, where they could gain the strength in this um, great um, philosophy of Bernie Siegel. And he had a lending library, and there was this book, The Cancer Prevention Diet by Michio Kushi. It was a book about macrobiotics. And I, I had seen many other books on tapes and all. I took them all home, but this is the one that really stuck with me. And when I opened up to the page, it said non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It said I could be healed. It was the first idea that I could possibly recover from this condition. So I brought the book home, and I was very excited to tell my husband, we're going to change our way of eating. And we ate meat in our family, and I go to the butcher shop and have the meat cut for me and eat lots of foods that I thought were really healthy, what I was brought up with. But I realized in my situation, I needed to change my way of eating. And being plant-based was really what made a difference completely. So my husband was very uh, agreeable to do anything for me. Um, he supported me all the way through all of this condition. And um, I went to the doctors, and I did the chemotherapy as they asked. Because at the moment, I wasn't being told that I didn't need the chemotherapy. I did it for nine months. And when I went through all the x-rays, I saw an x-ray. Um, and they said, you may come in to see them yourself. So that was great to view it. And at that process, um, I could see that the cancer was somewhat shrinking. And the doctor said to me, do not get excited. You must understand you have a terminal illness. And so um, at that point, I kept eating my macrobiotics. I told him on a special way of eating, but I didn't tell him it was macrobiotics. But I told him I was eating a special way, and they began to get alarmed because I was losing weight. But what I was losing was cancer. Actually, it was actually dissolving in my body. And they got to the point where they said, um, you reach this period, and you have to be on chemotherapy for the rest of your life. And at that point, I said, I want to keep you uh, as my doctors, and I'll come and have my checkups once a month or whenever I need to be here. But I'm not doing any more chemotherapy. I'm now do, li living a different way and eating different foods. And they just were very concerned. They said, you're, you're losing a lot of weight, and you, that's not going to work for you. Um, well, sure enough, it did work for me. I kept going to see Bernie Siegel being part of this wonderful group of women that were in the healing process, too. But uh, what I found was that I did get completely cured of cancer. It was just such an incredible thing. And they, they, the doctors just shook their head and said um, they couldn't understand what I had done that would make that so different. But here I am today, and it's been 29 years I've been free of cancer. It's my joy to be on this panel and be on this cruise. I've been on it for 14 years, and let me tell you, it's a joy to be here and to be of any help to anyone um, that just wants to talk and uh, share situations they may have, um, because this is such a, um, just a wonderful fellowship, and um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Julie. Next is Joel Bryce. G'day everyone, I'm uh, Joel Grace and I'm here from Australia. Uh, this is my second year on the recovery panel uh, and I'm here because uh, almost six years ago I had a very aggressive form of cancer uh, diagnosed when I was 31. I had stage 3 metastatic melanoma and was given only a 10 or 15% chance of surviving, uh, which isn't the news that you want to hear when you're only 31. Um, now, for those that don't know, the metastatic basically means that the cancer has spread throughout your body. So, hearing that you have cancer is bad enough, and then hearing that it's spread is even worse, pretty much. Um, so, I had four tumours in my neck that were secondary tumours, ones that had spread. Uh, the biggest one was five and a half centimetres, and ended up having to have those four tumours and 44 lymph nodes taken out because the tumours were in my lymphatic system. Uh, I had a short course of radiation, but chose not to do chemotherapy. Uh, it's just something that I didn't believe in. Uh, I didn't want to poison my body. Uh, I wanted my body to heal itself. Um, interestingly, uh, the tumours in my neck were ones that had spread. Uh, so the cancer had to start from somewhere, and it started from a primary tumour. Uh, that primary tumour for me was at an unknown origin. That basically means that I went into natural remission uh, and the doctors have no idea where the cancer originated. 
Uh, so the interesting thing with that was I used to live a standard or Australian or American diet and lifestyle. Uh, I would always think that I was healthy uh, as I was putting half a bag of frozen fries in the oven or frozen pizza with a little handful of salad or veggies and thinking that was healthy. Um, I was on heaps of different types of medication, all the antibiotics, um, anti-anxiety, anti-everything basically. Uh, and lived a really stressful job, a um, really um, high profile corporate job that had a lot of stress that went with it. So it's no wonder how I got sick. Uh, at the start of 2013, I decided, you know what, I want to change my life. I'm going to go cold turkey off all the medication and I'm going to do a green juice fast, first time in my life. Uh, through that process, it was a great process, I really enjoyed it. I had a mole that was on the top of my head that disappeared. We now suspect that that mole was the primary tumour that naturally remissed or naturally disappeared through diet and fasting alone. Now, if I had known that I was fighting cancer at the time, I would have done an extended fast, so it would have gone all out of my body rather than getting stuck in my lymphatic system. Uh, but these are the things that you learn with hindsight. Um, now, the key thing to take away from it uh, that the doctors told me was don't bother changing your diet, it won't work. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't listen to their advice. Uh, so the things that I did to beat cancer, uh, from all the holistic therapies, the very first thing I did overnight was change to a plant-based diet, uh, which was pretty easy for me, because I was never a big fan of cheese, so I didn't have that sort of attachment to it. Didn't have a big taste for meat, but still ate a lot of it. Uh, did a lot of green juicing, green smoothies, wheatgrass juice, uh, mostly, uh, organic and mostly raw diet as well. So for the first 18 months of healing, mostly raw. Um, also did a lot of intravenous therapies um, through a nutritional therapy like high dose vitamin C, high dose glutathione. I did a lot of colonics to cleanse my body. I did a lot of coffee enemas. Actually, I did a lot of wheatgrass enemas, turmeric enemas, probiotic enemas. Um, lemon animus, garlic animus, pretty much anything you can put up your butt, I did. <laughs> in the name of health, of course. Um, now, it's going to seem like a strange thing to say, but I think that getting cancer was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. Uh, I really do believe that. I'm now fitter, I'm healthier than I've ever been in my life. Uh, through no effort of my own, I lost more than 70 pounds. Um, and I'm completely cancer free. Uh, now, the message that I always like to tell people when they're trying to uh, embark on a similar journey, there's three key things. I always recommend that people go natural first. The doctors will always be pressuring you to start chemo or radio or surgery immediately. You have time. You have time to do your research, you have four, six, eight weeks, which is plenty of time to figure things out. Uh, next thing is stick to it. You're not going to get overnight results just from a 10 day fast. Uh, as long as the disease that you want to take is, can be as long as it will take to get out of your body. And the third thing is different things work for different people, so believe in what you do. Um, don't just do what other people have done. Do your research and figure it out for yourself. Um, now I've opened a health and wellness centre, I own my own colonic clinic just so I can help people uh, heal themselves in the same way that some people helped me. Um, and that's my story. Thank you. So much. Great. Next we have John Funk. It's great to be back this year. Um, I want you to put yourself in a position that I was in in 2015 when I came on this cruise with my wife for the first time. Um, when we came, I had been vegan five years. I had been exercising regularly for three or four years. And what happened was I got home from this cruise and in three months I had a heart attack. And so my story is different. My story is maybe one that you need to hear as much as you need to hear these which is what if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, but you still have that health effect, then why? Or was it worth it? So let me tell you my story really quickly. In 2010, at the beginning of 2010, I weighed 260 pounds. 
Today, when I got on the ship, I have a weight here, but when I got on the ship, I was 159. So I decided then, for professional reasons, job changed, that I needed to lose some weight, and I was just happy at that point with losing 30 or 40 pounds. I had a friend, a colleague at work, who said, no, you need to go on my diet, on the Joel Furman Eat to Live. I said, fine, as long as it works. Six weeks, 28 pounds lost. The end of the year, nine months later, 100 pounds lost. So that was my first step. Second step is although I felt great, stopped taking statins after 15 years, I have bad knees, and believe me, taking 100 pounds off of your knees works miracles for people with arthritis. But I still kind of felt blah, and my dear wife, who had supported me through this dietary change, not completely joined me, but supported me, said, maybe you need to check out your hormones. So I went to her longevity doctor and did some tests, and found out that I needed some tweaks in my home. We made those tweaks. I gained all that energy, all that positivity, all that motivation that kind of lacked. And with that, a few months later, I started a new job and I was sent to Johannesburg, South Africa for an extended work period. And I thought, as I got there, oh, let me, let me preface this by saying, my wife, dear sweet wife, sitting there and out there said, after I lost 100 pounds, she said, why don't you tone up? <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> I just lost 100 pounds. <laughs> but, and I'm the kind of person, if somebody tells me to do something, I won't do it, just because they want me to do it. <laughs> but I found myself in Johannesburg for, for an extended work assignment. I said, what am I going to do? And there, we couldn't leave the hotel without a driver and security. And I said, what am I going to do? So the first Saturday, I went out to the nearest mall. I bought myself some workout clothes and shoes, and I started working out. That was six years ago, a little bit more. And so from that first day of working out, where I thought I was going to die, because I had not worked out since before we were married, um, I now work out and, and quickly started to work out, usually twice a day, every day. And so, so I thought I had a thing. I came on this cruise in 2015, and I heard Dr. Esselstyn speak, and I thought, oh, I'm going to get his book on preventing person heart disease, which I did, but I didn't read it <laughs> until May when I had a heart attack. So um, I guess my story is this. I had the heart attack, and the following things happened. I drove myself to the ER. I was care flighted. Two minutes later, they said, you're having a heart attack. Flew me by care flight helicopter to the nearest uh, bigger hospital with a cath lab. I went in and sat down, and I had uh, a 24-year-old, well, he looked like 24-year-old cardiologist who said, I'm going to be your cardiologist. I said, really? <laughs> I'm laying on the cat table at the, car, at the, at the uh, cath lab, and the technician putting up, you know, the thing up my groin artery says, you're in really good shape. Hmm. I said, it didn't stop me from being here on this table. <laughs> oh, see, there I am. Okay. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> And then my doctor walks in an ICU after he places the stand. They're doing an EKG and he's looking at it. He says, there's no evidence on this EKG that you ever had a cardiac event. <coughs> a month later, we had an echo stress test, echocardiogram stress test. <coughs> and he looked at that and he said, You're, you suffered no damage. Your heart suffered no damage from your event. My wife and I are convinced that if I had not made those lifestyle <coughs> excuse me, changes before, that I'd be dead. Mm -hmm. And so thanks to those changes, I'm here with you again today. I really appreciate being here. Thank you.
Terry Stralo. Hi. My story starts in June of 2013, and it actually starts with my sister. My sister had a ruptured appendix, and when she went in for her emergency surgery, wow, they discovered she had colon cancer. And because I've been struggling for two years with reflux problems and actually had become allergic to many of the different Prilosec and Dexalan, a whole bunch of stuff, um, I mentioned I had an appointment the next day with my gastroenterologist and told him my, my sister had colon cancer. And he was like, wow, well, you really need to have a colonoscopy. He, my sister was 56, I was 57. And I was like, no, I don't eat processed food. I don't eat fried food. You can eat chicken and salmon. That's the good stuff for you. I really take care of myself. And he said, you don't understand. If your sister has colon cancer and it's a genetic related thing, you have a 50% chance that you have it too. I don't know if he was lying or not, but he convinced me. So I had a colonoscopy, and wow, I was just shocked. I had colon cancer. Mine was more advanced than my sister's was. Um, and I, I mean, you, they brush you into stuff. I wound up within a week of having surgery, and they said, oh, it's in, they told me in the beginning, oh, it's small, it's all. But then after the surgery, they said, oh, it's in the lymphatic system. That makes it stage three colon cancer. And my sister's was stage two, because hers was smaller. Well, I had always said I would never, ever do chemo, and they told me that that's what I absolutely had to do. And I just said, okay, well, let me go home and think about it. So I started researching it. I watched Forks Over Knives. There's another video called Healing Cancer from the Inside Out. I called all my kids, and I said, you know, I am just not going to do chemo, but I'm not ready to just, you know, put the sheet over my face and lay down. I'm going to fight this in some way. So I decided to go whole food plant-based with a lot of juicing. I had heard of a place called Hallelujah Acres where this guy had gotten colon cancer when he was 42 and now he's in his 80s and he's just fine. So I just decided every day I was going to juice and um, everything that I read that said it killed cancer cells, I did it. I sprouted broccoli every day. I took all this juicing stuff. I ate onions and garlic and a lot of raw food but um and and my oncologist actually said i was a fool for not taking chemo but i said well that's fine in five years i'm going to prove to you that diet makes a difference and he said diet doesn't make a difference but he would follow me and he would do the scans and everything so the way i was healed was just by the food my sister on the other hand is a nurse and followed the doctor's orders completely. She had four different episodes where it kept coming back, and um, four different surgeries, four different kinds of chemo, and she died in 2015 in September, and I'm fine. So I just have always felt that if it was a genetic component, the food makes a difference. Um, my re the other things that disappeared when I changed my diet because of the reflux and the GERD that they'd said, well, Thank goodness that went away because I was allergic to all the medicine. I had a ganglion cyst in my hand, in the middle of my hand, and it just kind of disappeared. I had hemorrhoid problems, they just kind of disappeared. Oh, and between the first and the second scan, because they do um, scans every year when you have colon cancer, in the beginning they told me I had an inactive kidney stone, and the next scan it was gone. And I kind of think I would have known if I passed it. I think it just <laughs> dissolved. I don't know. But um, I also wanted to say that my, my husband and my mom are out there. Raise your hands, guys. Okay. So my husband doesn't cook. So he eats what I cook. And, but he likes to clean the kitchen. So it's a really good encouragement for the two of us. But he had gout and hypoglycemia. And after he started eating what I was eating, he never had another episode of either one of those things. And after my sister passed, then my mom thought, she, uh, she's um, 82 now, I hope that was okay to say. <laughs> and after my sister passed away, she decided, well, maybe the diet would help her. So she started in January 2017. She had um, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, all the statins, all the usual stuff when you get to be that age. And she had COPD. And um, the actual 
Uh, we found a plant-based cardiologist about 20 minutes from us. She had a carotid artery that was 65% blocked. They were waiting for it to get to 70 to put stints in. And so this cardiologist started following her and encouraging her with the plant-based. And she actually, the last scan, uh, ultrasound that they did is completely clear, like, like the new vein. She doesn't have her COPD. She could not even walk up a flight of stairs. And now she does line dancing at the senior center and three different yogas. She's just, is really, really um, a benefit to all of us. And I just say, it's never too late. Go for it. Thank you so much. Club. Hello and thanks for letting me be here, part of this panel. Um, my story is very similar to a lot of them. Uh, I started, uh, I was asymptomatic and in 2008 I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and I was one of those people that there was like I kept getting a funky pneumonia and they were giving bronchitis um, antibiotics and then one year I was, uh, I went to get a physical and I thought I should get that done because I kept getting rails in my chest my, and so my doctor called me and she was, I think we, I think we've got uh, mono. So I, I was moving down to Nebraska, or, uh, North Carolina, and I had a blood test there, and that was it came back that I didn't have mono. But I had also had a, a chest X-ray, and they called me back in, and, and uh, they said we've got to check this out. So they sent me to, they thought I had asthma, so they sent me to a, a clinic in Toronto, or sorry, in, in Hamilton, to figure this out. But back in the, backtrack a bit, while I was figuring out if I had mono, um, I just kind of kept going, because you, you do, and I went, I was going to go on a work trip, and my friend said, before you go, let's just do a chest x-ray. And so I went into the Moses Cone Hospital, and Chris did a chest x-ray, and then all of a sudden she goes, I'm admitting you. I said, get the heck out of here. And she goes, we don't know what you have, but you are staying here. And so they put me in, in isolation. They didn't know what I had. They gave me every test. Uh, the, the attendees would come in and kind of put my food there and kind of leave. Because of course, they, I was like, they didn't know what was going on. So my journey took me to open one biopsy. And then they figured out what I had. And, and uh, so I, I immediately, because cancer's a family diagnosis, my partner was like, oh, we're doing chemo, you know? And I was like, oh, okay, we are. But I was fortunate that I knew a lot about nutrition, so I, I felt I knew what to do. Um, and, and so I really went hardcore vegan, and I did a comprehensive juicing program, and I was lucky to know some people that were in the energy field, so I did some biofeedback, and I really felt that that made a big difference. But I, I saw my, I did live blood cell analysis and I saw my blood. And I gotta tell you, that made me an active participant because I saw my blood. So in the juicing program I did, um, I did three weeks, or sorry, three months of steady juicing. I would juice a, a raw potato every morning to clean my blood. Turns out that potatoes clean the soil before you plant your sod. It also cleans your blood in the morning. Um, and then I would follow with wheatgrass. And my, uh, my natural path, because I hired a natural path, a Chinese doctor, and my oncologist, because I didn't believe I should trust, put my hands in one, put my life into one person's hands, because I didn't really want to do chemo. So I did the nutrition. And she, my natural path gave me a hug. She had never seen anyone clean their blood so fast. So that was very positive. And my journey just continued to do some extreme plant based. I, I changed the water in my home, I filtered my whole house, because it was something I breathed in, it looked like I had farmer's lung. So my, my non my is only my lung tissue, and my, my x-rays looked like I had snow in my lungs, which is very, very, very strange. To this day, my tissue is in a, a, some kind of study in, in um, Hamilton for people in their 40s with lung Hodgkin's lymphoma in their lung tissue. Anyway, so I changed my diet, I started, I became a food for life instructor. I couldn't get over the power of food. And uh, to this day, I'm a health coach or a cooking coach. And um, every year, I bring my mom on the cruise. And the other thing is, uh, my dad and I went through cancer at the same time. And so we just always wish that we had learned some more about that. Close, but almost. I'm not holding. <laughs> I'm from Holland, so part of my 
English, if I make mistakes. Um, I've been diagnosed with... Sorry. Is that better? I've been diagnosed with MS about... It's 20 years ago now. Um, I've got the flu injection two months prior to that, so that's still a strange story. Um, I got the MS and uh, my uncle sent me to an acupuncturist and he did some uh, uh, food allergy tests on me. He said, well, you're allergic to a lot of food. So that was the first step into the food world for me. Um, so we started using and, and uh, the green smoothie kind of thing and we went raw. There are a lot of cameras on. Um, and uh, I've got uh, several uh, attacks in a year, and uh, my, my doctor gave me all, all sorts of medication, but I was allergic or too sensitive on the medication. So in about 13 years after that, I said, well, I'm going to quit all that stupid medication. I was all sick all the time from the uh, side effects. And I've seen uh, food matters and forks over knives and uh, read all the books from McDougall and uh, Dr. Schwenk and uh, all those doctors and I said, okay, I'm going to quit all medication and my doctor was happy about it. He said, well, you're going to be in a wheelchair in a month and you're going coming back crawling, crying and so said, okay, that is my choice to come back for the medication, but now it's your choice for me to have the medication. And, well, I, I literally said to him, if you're willing to take the medication together with me, <laughs> then, I will, then I will take it. <laughs> Sorry you start laughing, so okay. Do your thing, and, but I'm going to monitor you for, for a year with MRIs. So we did MRIs, and he couldn't see any activity anymore on my scans. So he said the only thing he could say was, well, don't chase winning team. So that's what we're doing. We just quit it all and I'm clean now for six years, I think. So we're on the journey. Thank you very much, Sean and Dan Moskala. We're sharing our five minutes, so I'll be quick. In 2010, our son came home and wanted to be a bodybuilder and he sent me off to buy whey protein. And in a coincidence, I decided that it needed to be researched before I gave that to my son. And I Googled whey protein and came across a video called The Perils of Dairy by Dr. John McDougall. And I thought to myself, who is this crazy quack? But it was so fascinating to me that I was living in a parallel universe that this information could be available and I had known nothing about it that I started to read and became obsessed. And by 2011, I realized I could no longer feed my family in the manner that we had. So I decided April 1st, April Fool's Day, that we would do the whole food plant-based lifestyle. And I dragged my very upset family along with me. And over the next two years, I lost 133 pounds. What? all that I thought the whole food plant-based lifestyle had in store for us. I was back in my wedding dress, we were both healthier, I thought we were bulletproof. In that November of 2013, I realized that that was just the universe getting me ready for the fight of my life because my husband was diagnosed with stage 4 kidney cancer. Yeah, and uh, just to, to backtrack, she was upwards of three up to 300 pounds when she lost that weight. Wow. Uh, so November 9, 2013, after a day of splitting firewood and had extreme uh, abdominal pains that I had ignored all week, uh, that Saturday afternoon I decided I could no longer put off uh, the pain that I was feeling. Off to the emergency ward we went, and uh, thinking kidney stones because that runs in my family. And uh, off to the emergency ward, they did the scan that night. The doctor brought us, ushered us into um, uh, one of the waiting, uh, one of the examining rooms after doing the scans, and within two sentences said that um, um, 
Uh, he said, no, Dan, it's, it's, uh, it's not to kidney stones or kidney infections. Your right kidney is one massive tumor, uh, and it's stage four kidney cancer, uh, and that uh, it had metastasized out of the kidney up the vena cava and had spread to my lymph nodes. Um, the cancer itself would have taken about 20 years to grow. Uh, we, uh, I, the, that Christmas Eve, we spent at one of the hospitals and I had an extreme nephrectomy. They pulled the, vein, the, the tumor out of the vein of cava that had started to grow up to my lungs and heart uh, and cleaned out several lymph nodes. Uh, kidney cancer, stage four kidney cancer is terminal, apparently. And uh, there is not, uh, chemo and radiation is not effective, so that was not an option. The only possible option, although it wasn't to my benefit, I was then to be a guinea pig for uh, one of the drug companies and uh, offered to uh, try one of the uh, phase one trial studies for immunotherapy drugs. The, tri the protocol was supposed to be uh, four treatments every three weeks, followed by maintenance treatment for the rest of my life every two weeks. I only made it to the third treatment where I had a liver attack and uh, I was dismissed from it. From that 15 months, I went into quick remission with three remaining lymph nodes shrinking and shrinking, and by that February, uh, was cancer-free within 15 months, and they closed my file. Um, during the cancer diagnosis, I also started looking at, I'm, I'm a retired police officer, so on behalf of the first responders as well, uh, I just wanted to speak briefly as well as a secondary issue that I had been ignoring most of my service was uh, with respect to post-traumatic stress disorder. And I felt that as I had uh, conquered this cancer diagnosis, it was due time to start looking at handling the, the post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, I felt, uh, and like many illnesses, nutrition is also overlooked with post-traumatic stress. Uh, and uh, with our first responders, we know that it's a 44% uh, or we have 44% of our, 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 our uh, first responders compared to 10% uh, of the regular population. So here I am now five years and five months, uh, still cancer free, even though it was a terminal cancer diagnosis. A 5% chance of survival to make it to five years, and I blew past the five years back in November. Uh, with respect to the post traumatic stress disorder, I can certainly say that uh, I'm doing much better than I was with it several years ago, and I was ignoring it. And essentially, it's because of this woman's beautiful intelligence that I'm still here today. And to all of these wonderful physicians, and researchers, and groups, support groups, such as this cruise as well, that we're, we're all here. And we're so thankful to be here and participate with everybody. Next one, Carol Grimes. In 2004, um, I was diagnosed with relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis. I was devastated. I was in shock. I had fear. I had no hope. I felt helpless with that diagnosis. I proceeded to get a confirmation of a second opinion through Barrows Neurological Institute in Arizona that confirmed that through an MRI of my spine and of my brain and a lumbar puncture spinal tap. What was I going to do with that? All I knew was to follow doctor's advice. That started two years of blind placebo clinical trials with Barrows Neurological Institute. That was took me through one or two medications with side effects two to three pages long for each medication. That took me constantly being checked of my lungs, liver, my eyes, my hearing, my mobility. And after two years of that, I said, enough is enough. I can't handle this anymore. I'd already been on two antidepressants for depression and suicidal tendencies, and I was not a happy person. That was not only impacting my quality of life, but it was impacting my husband and my family's life. I knew something needed to change. I was having exacerbations every six months, which put me flat on my back. Uh, I had hearing loss, weakness, uh, pain throughout my arms and legs, dizziness. So in 2008, four years later, I was introduced by my brother-in-law to a holistic alternative treatment for treating the MS, and it was through Hallelujah Diet, and it was juicing. For the first year, I started juicing. I juiced carrots and apples and greens, and I looked orange, and it wasn't because of my carrots, it's because I was detoxing. 
But the more I did that, the more I learned and tried, the more I experienced. And I felt more life. And I could tell something was going on in my body. And I really liked what I was feeling. So I was off of all medications. I had gotten off all my antidepressants. Now what's important is you have to have a support system. Because the support system for MS is everybody wants to be a victim. Because as a victim, we get attention. It feels good. Everybody's looking at us. There's a payoff there. But I didn't like that. So I wanted something different. So I kept trying and experiencing, and I felt better and better. Well, then I remembered my father followed John McDougall for his cardiovascular disease. And in those days, it was on a cassette tape. So I listened to those. And then his books came out. And then the internet happened more. So I learned and learned and applied. From him, I then found out about Dr. T. Colin Campbell, learned more, read more. I love to read. And every time you read, you're just like, ah, oh, this is good. But then you got to apply it. So I would apply it and do it. And my husband, who said, if it's good enough for my wife, it's good enough for me. So he went on the journey with me. And we did that together. And the more I experienced, the more I felt better. I felt life, not death. But one thing I realized with Dr. Campbell is it's holism, not reductionism. So that journey was not only food, but it was seeing a biological dentist and having my uh, metals removed, my uh, root canals taken care of. It was replacing all my pots and pans with salad master cookware. It was uh, learning how to exercise and work on my core balance through strength training. It was also uh, learning about emotional and spiritual part of it, which for me was inner peace, inner healing, to know that I was worthy to be loved and to love to know that I could have peace and joy. And as I learned to release those toxic people, those things in my life, I could fill it up with truth. This June, it will be 11 years for me. I have run a half marathon. I play with my kids. I run around. And I am in the process of working with Dr. Shripra Banzo from Flagstaff, who my campus doctor, and her medical students, of putting my results into medical peer journals this next year. And I'm just very grateful and blessed that I have my husband and that I can take truth and replace the lies and I can live what I believe and be full of peace in life. Thank you. At 19, I had a stroke, which was surprising to everyone since I was a gymnast. Um, and they couldn't figure out why I hadn't had the stroke. Um, after uh, much testing, they came up with the long name, Takiyasu Arteritis, and told me I wouldn't live past 30. Uh, a couple of years later, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. I had become very malnourished, and um, inflammatory bowel disease just makes you weak, and you can't digest anything. You become housebound because you can't go anywhere. If you do, you know exactly where a bathroom is. Um, and that was my early, you know, 20s. And I was like, this is not what I signed up to be. And the more I went to doctors from, uh, I live in Nashville, from Vanderbilt to Mass General Hospital in Boston, they would tell me the same things, that I would just deal with the bad luck and they didn't have anything to do for me other than medication and uh, colon surgery. And so seven years I suffered in and out of the hospitals, um, hooked, up, hooked up the IVs, just going home and laying around. It was very different and depressing life for me. I was born in Chile, and I can remember my grandmother going to the yard and to the kitchen to get our remedies. And I started thinking back, there's gotta be some connection to all this. And so my family searched and we came across macrobiotics way before the internet we really had to search. And uh, when macrobiotics came into my life, it made sense from the beginning. I didn't want to do it, but it made sense because it was food going into my system. And it scared me a little bit because for seven years I have been told don't eat fiber, don't eat bulk, don't eat vegetables, cut down the raw, all the things that in macrobiotics was teaching whole foods. 
But I had to do something. I had to go, like you mentioned, inside me for a while. I had been to so many people telling what to do outside of me. And I trusted, and I stepped into it. And within the first week, things began to change. Within the first week, the food starts, began staying in my body and doing something. And so it didn't take long. And when the doctor suggested the first colon surgery, I said, no, I'm going to give this a try. And he got very upset and said, no, you're going to hurt yourself. This is not scientific or proven. And I just burst out in tears and said, what else can I do? Look at me. I have to do something. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to make it much longer. And here I am, you know, you tell me not to do something I, I have in my hands to do. And so he said, okay, but I'm going to follow you even more closely, which is great because he watched me get well before his eyes. And he took interest. He would ask me, what are you doing for different things? And I would say, well, I have this miso soup that I make. And, and he said, well, if it's working for you, go ahead and keep it up. But he would not share the information with anybody else. And he watched my blood test get clear, my um, ultrasounds come back clear. And what I have suffered with for seven years and nine months, I was off my medicines. I was able to avoid colon surgery. And I was able to, for the first time, look that I would have a second chance in my life. And so I did. I got married. I had two children. I raised them this way. I teach a lot of young people because it's a young person's disease. And my uh, youngest uh, patient was two years old with Crohn's. And that's just heartbreaking to deal with some of that young and the, and the parents trying to learn. But it is an environmental causing condition. And only whole foods traditional cures is what's going to get you over it. And I'm just so glad I stuck with it. And all these years later, that's what I voice about is really look in, really change your life, and adjust the food to what your body's trying to metabolize in the healthiest form possible. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So for me, the takeaway is this stuff doesn't work. <laughs> right? No. That was fantastic, incredibly inspiring. Because we started late, I'd like to suggest that we go late for those who are interested in participating. We have the opportunity to ask our panelists some questions. If you need to go, feel free to make your exit. But for anyone else who wants to stay, what I'd like to do is bring a couple of mics into the audience. Does anyone else want to be a mic person? Um, does anyone have a question for anyone on the panel? Come on down and ask it with a mic. Uh, it's okay. okay. Hi, my name is Polly. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. I heard from one of your speakers here mention about uh, you were thinking that at one point you wanted to be a victim in order to get attention. And then later on you also uh, find inner peace to heal yourself. Uh, at the moment I have a sister-in-law who is quite sick, uh, her cancer relapsed from acute lymphoplastic leukemia. So it seems that every time I mention about plant-based food or macrobiotics, she sort of shy away. And uh, it it's really concerns me, but I, <clears throat> I got advice that let it go, let it go, she's not ready. So what's your view on this uh, in handling a situation like this? Who would like to take this question? We have two mics for the panel. Does anyone? OK, here. I think you need to just keep loving her. And I think you need to just keep, uh, I said, I think you need to just keep loving her because at times we are not wanting to hear things. We know, we know down deep inside um, that we want to change, um, but I think you need to just say, you know, I love you, and I want you to know I see you, and I hear you, and I value you, <coughs> and part of loving you 
I want to be here for you to help walk through that journey. And I'm ready to be here for you to take that next step when you're ready. But I'm always going to be available. And that's all you can do and when they are ready. Because they have to resolve some things within in themselves to be able to receive the next step. Because the things that we're going through are symptoms of what is going on inside of us. Whatever we're troubled with, whatever we believe, uh, so much emotion stuff impacts the, the symptoms of, of what we're going through. So I just say keep loving her. No guilt, no shame. Just love and be there and ready to answer her when she's ready. Thank you. That's fantastic. Does anyone else either want to address that or do we have another question? Let's take this question. Hi, this message. Thank you all for your stories. And uh, I've been plant-based, not as religious as my friend, but I'm doing the best I can for about five years. And I wanted to ask Dan a question. I have a, a friend of the family's, a, a good friend of the family's brother in Montana has stage four uh, kidney cancer. And had, the, uh, I think this past fall, or September, he had one kidney removed and uh, is taking chemo pills of some sort, lives in Montana. And always has been healthy, age 66. And uh, of course he's living on his brother's cattle ranch. And uh, they, I don't think diet is very really good. But I wanted to follow, I wanted to, I was trying to take notes copiously and you said after your wife, uh, um, uh, uh, that um, you did a 15 month trial, I know you had the tumor removed to vindicate it and you did, I didn't hear you talk about, did you do the diet? I was talking So to what had happened was, as we said, Sean kind of dragged us along and in those two years that I, she started us up, I was, at a, I was eating that way in the home, so 95% plant-based. All the other symptoms or the illnesses also disappeared. Pre-metabolic or metabolic syndrome, pre-diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, 35 mm -hmm. pounds loss. So I went into the cancer very, very healthy. Um, f uh, diagnosis was November. Surgery was December. I healed extremely well, much to the surprise by my physicians. Then by March, and again because I was so healthy. I was, they were able to watch and wait, which sometimes is not something they do for, especially to stage four. So by that March, uh, they, uh, they said, well, they, we don't want to muddy the water because if you do another treatment, that negates you from doing a trial study. So by March, we were accepted into the trial study with immunotherapy, that would have been nivolumab and ipilimumab, which now has been licensed as Abdevo. Uh, but, uh, so I went into that trial study uh, by the March, uh, so March, April, May, uh, the th first three treatments, uh, and then I had this side effect where it attacked my liver and uh, was was dismissed from it. And then... So concerning the fruit, food specifically, when Dan was diagnosed, of course, you know, we've been doing this, I've been doing this exclusively at home for two years, and you're suddenly, you know, kind of like, okay, well, I've been reading all of this, let's put it to the test and I really started to focus my reading on nutrition and cancer specifically and there's a hundred years of data showing that animal protein is linked to cancer cell growth so I started what I called our program of nutritional excellence and I really refined our diet to you know no oil no sugar nothing processed whole grains no flour um, not specifically raw but really super clean, and he wasn't allowed to leave the table until he ate his heap of greens. <laughs> and so, <laughs> well, it didn't matter if he liked it or not, he was doing it. And so, um, you know, I wanted him to go, I wanted him to be ready for that surgery. It was a major surgery. And so I wanted him to be as healthy as possible for the surgery. And then, um, you know, even through the whole trial study, which was, you know, you have to do so much testing to get into those, they, you know, your baseline. So the whole time we were like, we want it noted that we're whole food plant-based. If this is an experimental science project, let's have all the data included. They would not include that at all. The only thing they ever asked was, how's your appetite, not what you're eating. And when we would say it, they're like, doesn't matter, we don't care. 
And of course, you know, I mean, nobody makes any money sending you home to eat vegetables and drink water. And they want, if he was to get better, they wanted it to be just because of the drugs. So, so basically, having that good background with the healthy eating, you feel has helped you because I mean, it is a a, a bad diagnosis usually with a bad outcome. So that has helped you significantly. It helped us too. And yeah, there's there's current just quickly there's current research being done now with fecal transplants that are that are being used for C difficile and other other issues. Uh, and now they're starting to research for melanoma as well as uh, kidney cancer. Uh, what they are finding that is uh, individuals that have fecal transplants have uh, uh, better responses to the immunotherapy drugs uh, because their gut biome is so healthy. Where do they get the fecal transplant uh, samples for fecal transplants? From whole food plant-based eaters. But this is we, you know, pardon the language, but we have this ass backwards. We could be eating vegetables, <laughs> ingesting vegetables, but now, in, you know, it's interesting research, but we know the power of the gut biome. But, you know, you want to consider having somebody else's poop rather than take the vegetables in. But no, without a doubt. So, had I not been on plant based, what am I, would I have had the same response from the immunotherapy? I don't think so. I'm glad you did what you did. Great, do we have any other questions? Um, to the, 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 the lady that I'm looking at here, um, I have a friend who has MS and I've told him about trying a plant-based diet and I still see pictures of him having meat on Facebook. And um, can, can I forward an article to him about the research that you said you would be a part of? Um, uh, when it happens, you can go, uh, my husband and I now in retirement to share my story. I've been, been speaking at medical students, first year medical students and community colleges. So we have a website, it's um, hufu, W-H-O-F-O-O, adventures.com, hufu adventures. So if you go there, there's a resource page, there is a link to our YouTube channel, and we'll be having that posted as it comes. I'm also being, I've just been interviewed with the Arizona Channel 12 News. Uh, on my story, uh, the reporter started me with me at the very beginning of my journey, and now she is doing an uh, interview where I am now, 11 years later. So everything will be on there. But Dr. John McDougall is another spot to go to with Dr. Roy Swank's work that he has continued. Um, that's an awesome place to go to for all free resources. But I'd be glad if you go to my our website. Uh, there's an email on there. You can email me, she can email. I'd be glad to speak with anybody. Um, it's just all about next steps. What's your next step in this journey? And it's hard as a friend to share this. Let me say, because I've shared it with many people. Um, and I have had maybe out of 12 people, maybe I've had maybe one person really come back. Because it's very easy to stay in medicine and a victim and the attention than to take. There's a saying in recovery, it says that the pain, that change does not happen until the pain of where you're at is greater than the pain of change. And all of us, it takes different things to make that pain and that crisis um, enough to go there. So just love, be there for them, you can refer them, but um, it's their journey, they have to embrace it. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Great, thank you for delivering the mic. Hi, thank you all. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, it's our second year and I heard of the lectures but I never tire for the positive emotional energy that I get from listening to you and I'm grateful. I'm a crier usually so I'll hold the tears back. But uh, I'm also a little scientist and, and I'm aware that those who didn't make it are not on the panel. So how does somebody who is struggling with advice from a doctor decide, you know, because there's data and there's data and there's good advice, but how do you decide to drop everything? You know, and how do you decide? Sometimes you don't drop everything. There's a lot of good benefit to medicine and pharmaceutical. It's not all bad. They're not the evil empire. You know, so how do you navigate it? And, and a little bit, I don't know who to answer, should answer it, but what is the data of, I know it's a lot of diseases from heart to cancer and other failures, 
What is the data about survival of people on this track? And I don't know who should answer it, but thank you all, and it's really positive. I know for me, at that young age, it was very difficult to go against what they were telling me. But I also remember inside of me, things not making sense, that I would die young, that I would have to be on these medicines that did not give me quality of life. I was merely surviving, and I think that was the crucial point for me was, there's got to be something else. And I did the hand-holding with the medical community. I didn't get off my drugs. I stayed on my drugs, and I started my program. And the more confidence I saw in my program, and it was very obvious which was my program, because the drugs had so many side effects, that I was improving, that it didn't take me long to realize this is the road for me. Even though they don't agree, I'm, I'm making the choice now. I'm choosing a different way. And that's, that's what it took for me. It, it came from inside the side and can't just take what I'm hearing. And there's got to be another way. Yeah. yeah, where's the gentleman that asked the question? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I listened to Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn speak in a very small community. And um, his message resonated so strongly with me, I wanted to learn more. So I read his book, Reverse and Prevent Heart Disease. And I, I have to say that the research he did um, is largely anecdotal. And I, I understand your concern about that. It's not a huge study with thousands of people. But his research was so overwhelming with the, with the people that he worked with. These are people that were all destined to die within weeks, months, or perhaps a year. They were people that couldn't function anymore. They were very, very ill people who had heart disease. And he took the people that other cardiologists had just said, hey, I can't do anything more for these people. And he took these people and he put them on a very strict whole foods, plant-based diet, the one that I'm on today. And he had um, a 100% success rate. So yeah, it's anecdotal, but it's still overwhelming. So you know, where do you draw the line? And, uh, Thank you. Um, I just want to add to that. Um, I also uh, followed Paul Wood Esselstyn, and in fact, he um, called me on the phone several times and helped me and advised me when you know I got to like a glitch. I went to the farm and went to a two-day immersion, and that was very motivational and also very helpful in talking to other cardiac patients. Um, I also had a long history at this point. Now I. I kind of look back and think, why didn't I wake up earlier? Um, I trusted the doctor so much. And by the time I got to the bypass, and there's nothing else but more bypasses, and multiple doctors saying the same thing, I thought, well, then I need to find new doctors. And I had, you know, had to doctor shop. I now go two and a half hours, um, thanks to my patient husband, <laughs> um, helps to drive me to uh, Orlando, Florida, and I now have the only three doctors I go to are a plant-based doctor, who's also an MD, a plant-based uh, cardiologist who does it herself, they all do it themselves, and a lipid specialist, which I didn't even know there was such a thing, because I'm one of those people that even though um, I've been doing this for seven years, 100%, 365 days a year, um, I still have cholesterol that hovers around 200. Um, the only n number that's bad that makes it bad is the LDL. I just produce a massive amount. Um, even Esselstyn told me, don't worry about it because if you're eating the way I'm telling you to eat, then um, you know, you're not forming any blockages. Well, the recent tests really prove that. I spent four days in a hospital in November with them telling me I had a heart attack only to find out I didn't have a heart attack. And there's no damage from anything to my, you know, my heart at 72 is totally normal. And um, they said that the testing was um, skewed by, uh, and because I had symptoms that, that were caused by the collateral system that shut down. The collaterals are little vessels that open up some, in some people when you have blockages. And I had lots of blockages in multiple parts. Um, I should say lots of plaques. 
and then I had mul um, I didn't get a chance, I don't think, to say my blockage that sent me to the bypass was like 99.6% or something. At the top of the left main, two-thirds of the blood supply was being cut off. Meanwhile, I was doing Zumba at the gym, and they, that's why they said I literally had two to three days left to live, and I was going to die instantly, and that if I'd had multiple surgeons standing in front of me, they couldn't have saved me. So at that point, I felt like I had nothing to lose. The future looked pretty grim, and I felt like I've got to like take control of this rather than let them control my life. So now if I don't like what I hear the doctors say, I've just shopped around. Now I'm finding people that understand what I'm doing. And the reason I go to the lipid specialist is because the cardiologist still wanted me on 10 milligrams of statins. And um, I, I got down the other, the other uh, doses were cut. I was at 80 at one time. I could hardly walk. Um, I was cut to 40, then to 20 then to 10 because my numbers kept dropping when I first started plant-based. But they want to, to just cover themselves with that last 10. After this last incident, when I went into the emergency room, they said, list your medications. I said, none. And I, well, I started naming my supplements, like B12, <laughs> baby aspirin. And they said, no, 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 we want your prescriptions. I said, oh, there are none. And they said, you won't leave here without some. Well, the interventional cardiologist knew what I was doing, and he said, you don't need to take anything other than what you're doing, so. <laughs> I, um, just, I just wanted to say, I have two rules on doctors. One is, if uh, your doctor doesn't support a plant-based lifestyle, find a new doctor. And the other rule is, if your doctor doesn't look healthy, find a new doctor. <laughs> great note to end on because we're getting close to dinner. Thank you everybody for your patience. Thanks to the panel again. Let's give it up for our recovery. And remember tomorrow at 215 if you want to continue this discussion, many of them will be there. You can ask more questions. Thanks very much.